Welcome to A Learner's Journey. My name is Molly Sanders, and the goal of this podcast is to inspire and motivate you by connecting you with a variety of passionate horsewomen and men who have dedicated their lives to helping horses and their people. I'm grateful you're here. I wanted to start off by saying that uh, I'm, I'm almost a year into doing this podcast and the community that listens to it often uh, requests different people. And your name is probably one of the most frequently requested. So your name has been on my to reach out to list since the, from the beginning. But every time I look at it, I think, oh, he probably won't ever get back to me or he has you know too much going on. And And then a Facebook post came up that you were teaching a clinic in my hometown this weekend, July 9th and 10th. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to reach out and see. And so I did. And then you responded right away. And then I had this like flashback to being a teenager and working up the courage to call somebody and then they answer and you go, oh my gosh, I didn't know. I didn't think about what I do if they answer. I didn't think they were going to answer. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm just really delighted that you're joining me and doing this. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, So one of the things I wanted to start uh, by asking you is there's a little bit of a debate going on among people around me on how to say your first name. And I thought you might be able to end the debate. Well, you know, it's what's really interesting is I have a, I have a, a YouTube channel that I have mm, three hundred plus videos on, and at the start of every one of those videos, I pronounce it correctly. Okay. Uh, it, it's pronounced Warwick. It's spelled Warwick, but the second right. W is silent. Okay. And I actually, it's such a big deal that I actually did a a, a YouTube video on it. And I was, oh, really? in, I was in England at the time mm-hmm. and I went to visit Warwick Castle. Okay. And so I'm at Warwick Castle and I uh, you know, make this video. G'day, I'm Warwick Schiller. But you know what? I, I have a lot of people say, you know, or a lot of people pronounce my name differently than I pronounce it. And I actually right. corrected someone one time. I don't normally correct people, but I corrected someone one time or pointed out to someone and they said, oh, I thought you had a speech impediment. <laughs> like I couldn't say my own name. <laughs> I said, so here I am at Warwick Castle. It's been here since the 1100s. So let's find out how you actually pronounce the name that my, how, the way my name's spelled. Right. And so I go to, to everybody. I go to the guy who's parking the cars. You know, I go to the, I find the curator of the whole thing. I go to the girl selling the ice cream. I also say Warwick Castle. I said, there you go. There you have it, folks. Warwick Castle. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story, you know, in the video, I said, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm doing this is because at the start of every one of my YouTube videos, I start out and say, G'day, I'm Warwick Schiller. And, and the reason this is important is because that information is right there in front of you. And it's very much, it's, it's like training information. People can watch a video and not see what's in the video. It can be right yes. there in front of you, you know, like, um, oh, I, want, I watched this video and I tried it, but it didn't work because, and I said, well, what happened when you picked up in the lead rope? Oh, I didn't do it with a halter on. You know, right, right. What, whatever it might be. And it was it's just about being observant. If you yes. want to learn from somebody, you've got to be observant. They can't do the observing for you. You, right. you know, to be a good student, you have to pay attention to the to the details. And so it's just, right. you know, I thought it was, while I was in England, I was at Warwick Castle, I just thought it was an opportunity to, to make a point that um you know, it's, it's really about, you know, if you want to learn from somebody, you want to, you want to be in a learning frame of mind. You know? Right, right, right. That's really interesting. Um, and I'll definitely link to that YouTube video and I'll watch it. That sounds really entertaining. I forget um, what it's called. It's not about pronouncing names. It's about paying attention. Or something like that. Okay. I'll, I'll find really it cool. for you. I'll find that's it for you. The tricky part with that though, like I love what you're talking about with being observant and really paying attention. And I totally agree that sometimes we can watch videos and only see certain pieces or pieces that we want to see. But with your name, I'm so visual. So I see, you know, I'll see the spelling of your name and, you know, in my mind, I think about it the way it it sounds in my head and I might hear you say it, but then I'll see the, I'll see the spelling and that'll like override it. So Mm. 
Yeah. So if you want to be like that, I could call you Molly. Right. Yeah. Because you have got two L's and I can right. pronounce every letter in your name. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people people tend to say what you just said about my name. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, it's, it's spelled like this. So I've got to pronounce all the letters. But if I do right. it to them, they're like, oh, well, you wouldn't do it with Molly. Right. You wouldn't call me Molly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's, good, an, good it's, an odd, it's an odd name mm-hmm. in this country. You know, in right. Australia, it's normal. In England, it's very normal. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank and, you. And then, and then the really bad thing is there was a famous singer who had the, the a last name of my first name and yes. she pronounced it wrong. Yes. Dionne Warwick. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, very cool. So um, tell us a little bit about how you got started. Like how did your horse story begin? Uh, I grew up on a 1200 acre sheep and wheat farm in Australia. Uh, Dad always had horses and um, he rodeoed for a long time. And um, yeah, we always had horses around the place. And I can't remember when I started riding. You know, I was, I'm thinking I was about seven, but I don't actually remember my first ride or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, and you know, on 1200 acres, they just put you on the horse and off you go. And if you come back, you come back sort of thing. And so, right. you know, T, I, you know, I, I do a lot of coaching, teaching sort of stuff. And, and most of the teaching I do is about horse training and these days more the mindset behind training horses. But what I'm not good at is a riding coach because the horse training didn't come naturally to me. So I had to learn it inside out, back to front. I had to know it intimately before I could do it well. I'm not, I'm not natural at it. Some, mm-hmm. you know, people who are, have, are just so natural, sometimes they can't even tell you what they do. So I'm very good at teaching people how to train horses, but I'm not a good riding coach because I don't remember learning how to ride. Oh, interesting. You know what I mean? I don't, yes. I don't remember that part. That, as far as I know, I've always been able to ride. Right. Right. So you didn't have to think through that part and struggle through that part. It's just been a part of you. Yeah. 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 I guess because I learned, you know, I learned to ride. So, so yeah, I don't know. But, but yeah, so I'm not, I mean, I can help you a little bit but I'm no Sally Swift you know what I mean right like I haven't turned it into an art because I didn't have to learn it intimately to be able to do it you know I've been riding since I was little so it's it's just second nature yeah yeah so when when did you know that you wanted to do it professionally well great question um well I've always been fascinated by I guess more the Western lifestyle, you know, mm-hmm. um, grew up around radios and stuff. And we showed at quarter horse shows and stuff when I was a kid. And I'd always wanted to come to America and, you know, see what the horse thing was like here. But mm-hmm. I never really had a lot of self-confidence. And so I never thought, oh, yes, I could do that. You know, I, I, I worked for a bank in Australia. Actually, I worked for a bank for six years. And at the time, you could take what they called a year's leave without pay. So you you could take a year off if you wanted young and wanted to go abroad and travel or whatever. Hmm. And so I came to, I took a year off to come to America to, I wanted to learn a little bit about training reining horses, just so I could go home and play with it myself. And through an acquaintance, I got a job over here working for a guy and I worked for him for a year. And, And the day I was leaving to go back to Australia, we shook hands on the porch and he said, if you want to come back, I'll give you, I'll give you a job. He said, you could do this for a living if you wanted to. And that was the first time I ever thought that was even possible. Hmm. You know, some people have a great deal of belief in themselves and almost a little bit too much. I've never really had much at all. So, That's you know, I needed somebody else to tell me that I could do this. I never, I never thought I could do it. You know? That's really interesting. I think that would surprise a lot of people because you carry yourself with, well, I'm sure you've built that confidence, but you carry yourself as somebody that has a lot of self-confidence. Is that something that you've just had to develop and build over the years? Or is that something you still actively are working on? Mm, that's a great question. That's like a therapist sort of question. <laughs> I think it's like the duck on the on the pond, you know, he's floating along on the top and his legs are going a million miles an hour underneath, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I was watching a couple of years ago, was, Robin and I were watching, my wife's name is Robin, we were watching American Idol. And there was this guy on American Idol and he was amazingly talented. Um, he was so good. I just didn't know how good he was. And he got to the final I don't know, they go to Hawaii, they do a concert, and I think they have the final 10, they come down to the final five, and they have to walk up on stage in front of, uh, I guess it's Katy Perry and 
Luke Bryan and say you, Lionel Lionel Richie, Lionel Richie had, yeah, had yeah. came up with a song. <laughs> and, and Lionel Richie said, the thing about being a star is you have to have equal amounts of unbelievable self-belief and whatever the opposite of that is. Right, doubt probably. Yes, yes. Yeah. you have to have the huge amounts of self-doubt and right. you've got to keep it somewhere in the middle. That's you can't so interesting. You can't just have self-doubt. Right. You want to make it. And you can't just be so full of yourself that you're not, you don't notice your flaws. Mm -hmm. You said you have to have equal amounts of both and you got to stay somewhere in the middle. Super interesting. I was like, whoa, that is a great, that's a, that's a great line. And, it, and it's almost like, you know, when, you, when you're in the public space a bit like I am, you've really got to get to where you, and this is hard, I, I still don't have it good yet, but you've got to get to where the people who love you and the people who hate you, you've got to ignore them both. Oh, that's really good too. You know, the people who think you are the greatest thing since sliced bread and the people who think you're the devil, they're both wrong. Oh, that's so good. So you can't just, you know, you can't just like, oh, they think I'm great. I am great. Uh, right. Because you're not. Mm -hmm. And they think I suck. Well, you're not that either. Right. Somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard. You know, like I'm an accidental whatever I am, you know, in the public space sort of thing. It wasn't a plan. It just kind of happened. And so there's no, there's no school for this stuff. Like when you become, um, you know, kind of widely known, maybe in social media or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever it is that's going on in my life now, mm -hmm. um, there is no school to how to navigate right. that space. You know? right. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting space to be in. Well, that brings me to another question that um, I want to ask you about social media. I, I think I saw you, it's probably five or six years ago, there was a YouTube video that came up and um, you were just, I, I don't remember exactly what you were talking about, but you were with a horse and just the way you communicated and the humility that you had and that, you know, you obviously had skills and were quite accomplished with horses, but you were, you were conveying that I'm, I'm still learning this stuff. And, you know, you were sharing some of the things that you were discovering. And I just, I was so impressed with that. And so I started to watch some of the things that you did. And you, um, one of the ones I remember really well is you went to a thoroughbred breeding farm and I don't remember where it was, but you um, interviewed the fella that did the breeding and you were really curious about how he trained his foals. And um, that, so that wasn't, that was a thoroughbred breeding farm in Australia. And it okay. wasn't the guy that was handling the foals wasn't the breeding guy. He was, oh. he was a horseman I know who actually spent quite a bit of time with Ray Hunt when he was younger. And oh, okay. he, once a year, he would go to this place that he'd, he'd um, halter break 150 thoroughbred weanlings that are still in their mother. That haven't been touched um and it's a big job yeah and i saw he showed me some video well i saw some video of what they end up like mm -hmm. and it was amazing and so i'm like i want to come and hang out with so he, he told i said how long does it take to do a set of them and he said oh a set takes about 10 days so i went to australia for two weeks oh that's so cool and uh went out there with him every day and the way I do things with every horse now, there's a little bit of that stuff that I learned from him. And it wasn't, it wasn't a technique I learned from him. Right. It was a way of looking at things that's probably a, a big part of, of, of everything I do these days. Oh, that's really interesting. So the thing that really struck me about that visit was you could have easily gone and just continued to interview him and have him show you some of the things that he does. It would have been a great interview, but you went a step further and had him coach you through some of the things. And again, I just, it just really struck me. It wasn't like you said earlier, you have never been somebody that thought, oh, I'm going to be Warwick Schiller. You know, my name will be in lights. You know, you didn't have that vision, but you, you just really struck me um, as somebody that wants to learn and is really curious. And you were really putting yourself out there. And so I wonder about that, especially with the things that you just shared about Lionel Richie and, you know, 
equal self-doubt as um, self-confidence. You're putting yourself into vulnerable situations and you continue to do it. You know, you've shared so many different things on social media and it's such a gift when people do that. But is that, does that come easily for you? Or, um, and if not, I mean, what do you do to stay in a healthy mindset, putting yourself out there? Great question. It didn't used to come easy to me in the slightest bit. Um, yeah, not having a lot of self-confidence, you almost don't want people to know you don't know stuff. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, so then you have this false bravado sort of a thing, you know, it's, it's kind of like bullies are actually scared little boys. It's kind of yes. the same thing as that to where you, where you don't have a lot of self-confidence. You kind of put on this air that you know what you're talking about because right. you don't want to, you don't want anybody to know that you don't know what you're talking about. Right. And I think for a long time, I was like that. Like I never had, never really had a mentor. And that wasn't because I didn't have the opportunity to have a mentor. I don't think I was open enough to, to be like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Just tell me what to do. Right. Uh, uh, about, oh, I suppose it's 20 years ago now, uh, uh, when I was, I was still training a lot of reining horses and a guy moved from Texas to here in California, not far from us. And they didn't have a covered arena and he used to come and ride with us quite a bit. And he was, he was great because he kind of made me realise it's okay to ask dumb questions. Like he would ask, quote, unquote, dumb questions all the time. And I weren't dumb questions, but just like, you get, I get no idea. How did he do that? Like, yeah. And there was no ego about him at all. He's a cool dude, one of my best friends. But, um, yeah, learn, like he was the one that kind of made me realise hmm, it's okay to. But the thing is, the thing about it is, you don't ask those questions because you are full of yourself. You don't ask those questions because you have so much, you have a lot of self-doubt and, yes. and, and insecurity and you don't really want to be vulnerable about that. It's, it's really about being vulnerable when, you, when you're asking questions like that. Right. And so, but then you come across as kind of cocky, mm -hmm. whereas you're not. Right. Um, I mean, some people are cocky because they have the right to be cocky, mm -hmm. meaning that they, they are very good at what they do and they're quite confident in themselves. Right. But then there's the other cocky, and I think it was the other cocky. Yeah. For quite, for quite a long time. Interesting. That's so, it's so interesting. I heard somebody say, and I wish I could quote them, I can't remember where I heard it, but that um, that idea of not wanting to ask the questions or not wanting to appear like we don't know what we're doing that people that push through that and persevere, their desire to learn or their desire to figure things out is just a little bit more than the uncomfortable, the, the wanting to avoid the uncomfortable feeling of looking like they don't know what they're doing. So it just has to be a little bit more that you want to figure it out. Yeah, but that, the, those ratios that, you know, if you give it a number from one to 10, mm -hmm. I wanted to learn, I wanted to learn stuff at a number nine, mm -hmm. but my insecurity was at a number 10. Right. You know right. what I mean? It wasn't like I was at a number three wanting to learn stuff. Right. And so I learned a lot of stuff from magazines because the magazine doesn't judge me. Right. Magazines and videos and stuff, they don't, they don't judge me. I don't have to be vulnerable to, to go, oh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, as I got further along, you, you know, I, you get to where you, you let that guard down. Um, more and more, but I think, yeah, I think initially I didn't, you know, I didn't have a mentor because I wasn't open to having one. Right. It's, it's really inspiring to hear you say these things because you, you know, you, you really do, you carry yourself um, and not even carry yourself. You, you seem to live with just who you are. You're, you're, you have a humility, you admit, you know, that I'm, I'm learning things like, it's, it's really interesting to me to, to know you in that way and in, in video, like, you know, I don't know you, but to know you in that way in video and listening to your podcast, but then to hear that, yeah, that's, that's still a work in progress, or it was a big struggle for me at one time. And I think that that's one of the things as humans, we tend to think that we're the only ones that oh, yeah. are having a hard time. Right. And then yeah. we hear somebody like you sharing 
that no, I, I struggle with stuff too. It's just, it's so, um, it's just inspiring. So I, I really applaud you for doing that. Um, and I, I just think it's a gift. Um, so yeah, yeah, well, that's, I've, I've been, I've been lucky to be put in some situations that, you know, kind of guided me this way, but you were saying something there a minute. Oh, you, you said I seem to carry myself a certain way. I'm a lot more comfortable in my own skin these days. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Like you said, your YouTube channel, are there videos from years back where mm-hmm. you'd be able to see the difference? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah, oh, yeah. I can see it. Okay. <laughs> I can see it, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm more comfortable in my own skin, and um, which means I probably know who I am a bit more than I used to. Um, who I really am mm-hmm. underneath all that, you know, that cultural influence and traumas and all sorts of stuff. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not who I thought I was. I'm not who I was basically conditioned by society to be. Right. And I think when you can start to unravel that, um, and I'm not there yet by any means. I've only just, I've only just you know, it's the tip of the iceberg. But when you can really start to unravel that and be comfortable with or find out who you really are and be comfortable with it, mm-hmm. oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a level of freedom yeah. that is, is pretty amazing. That's really cool. And now it's time for a short commercial break. This interview came about because of the many requests made on a private Facebook group called A Learner's Journey. This group is made up of horse lovers from all over the world who are dedicated to improving themselves for their horses. If you'd like to be a part of a positive, safe community designed to support you on your journey, we'd love to have you join us. There's a link in the show notes, or you can search Facebook for A Learner's Journey. And now back to the conversation with Warwick. Tell me a little bit about, so you've got this clinic coming up. Uh, you're, it'll be about 20 minutes from where I'm sitting. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, July 9th and 10th. So Saturday and Sunday um, coming up here. Um, and you, you travel a fair bit teaching clinics these days since covid kind of lifted or oh well, I've only just started back um, okay I've just only just started back I um probably about oh, three months ago it looked like this COVID thing might be finally clear enough to where I could start to travel so I said to my wife hey you can probably start booking me some stuff now and about two weeks later she said you booked every weekend until November <laughs> <laughs> okay wow she's good yeah that, that's awesome. But what I am doing a lot more this year is domestic clinics because usually I go to, pre-COVID, I would go to Australia four or five times a year. I'd go to New Zealand once. I'd go to UK once. I'd go to Europe once. Okay. And wow. then every once in a while, you know, you have these crazy opportunities to go other places. Like I went to Africa oh, a few wow. years ago, did some clinics, and I went to uh, Morocco in 2009. Yeah, it went to Mar- that, one, that one was crazy. I, I got invited by the, I got an email from the wife to the wife of the British ambassador to Morocco. I want to know, could I come to uh, Morocco and work with some horses for the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Horses, which falls under the jurisdiction of the prince. You got to meet the prince. Wow. How cool. Uh, went to the races in Casablanca. Um, you know, got to stay in the British ambassador's residence, get driven around in the, the Range Rover with the diplomatic plates by the ex-Special Forces guy, you know. And wow. Yeah, amazing opportunity. But that, those sorts of things pop up every once in a while. But, but for the most part, it's Australia five times, New Zealand, UK and Europe. But this year, you know, instead of booking overseas things in case COVID does take off again, I'm doing... Um, a lot of domestic, going to a lot of places I haven't been before. That's really great. That's really cool. So you're, you're doing a two day clinic Mm -hmm. um, here in Tacoma, Washington. Um, So what do you, what do you love about teaching these? Really seeing people's perceptions change about what's going on. And 
these days it's you know for quite a long time when i was doing clinics i was teaching people how to help their horses mm -hmm. and quite a, most people you can help some people you can't help I, you know those sorts of people i used to think oh god if you're not very good with horses you need to get a cat right preferably an outside cat sort of thing right. you know or just uh, a stuffed animal yeah yeah <laughs> but, but what i've come to realize is those people are not not good with horses those people are not good with themselves oh okay can, can you say more about that that you know they're, they're in their head they're not in their body they, they're not you know their body they a lot of times they're very incongruent so they their brains you know their mind's doing one thing but their body's doing something else or half their body's doing one thing and half their body's doing another thing so they are a lot of times they are putting on a brave front but really scared at the same time mm -hmm. and you know that that lack of attunement that lack of congruence makes horses cuckoo and and also it doesn't matter what physical cues you give if your intention behind it is not the same intention as what you're trying to project the message falls pretty short so previously like how, how long ago when did this shift happen when did you realize it's not it's not that they're not good with horses they're just not good with themselves oh as my unravelings happened interesting so, so how how have your clinics changed the clinics have changed more to where you know like at the start of the clinic well, let me back up a bit so my clinics are subscriber only clinics so i have a you know, my business is I have an online video library and I have, I don't know, six or 700 individual training sessions on there of all sorts of horses and videos from clinics all over the world and things like that. Um, and the reason I have subscriber only clinics is we did it a few years ago because I had people wanting me to do clinics everywhere and to, to and instead of saying no, I got to, I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to make them to where they subscriber only. To cut down then i don't have to say right. no because right. you know yeah but that that people pleasing tendency of me didn't want to be the bearer of bad news you know right but it worked out really well because what would happen before is you'd have you know let's say half the people at the clinic are subscribers and have a really good idea of what i'm on about and what i do and how to go about things and the other half have no idea you right. got to spend all day helping the other ones catch up and so that was that was one of the the benefits but the other thing is you know there's all the lead up work to it at the clinic i'm not telling you something you've not tried before i'm refining what you've been working on watching the videos and show you how you can do it differently so that you can go ahead and so when you go home you've got the rest of the videos to go, right. to go yeah, through it's, it's not like you go to a clinic and then you go home and you go i don't know what to do now right so as far as the how the clinics have changed I think everybody that comes to clinics is aware of where I'm at in life now. Right. And at the start of the clinic, I, you know, I'll have a bit of a talk about that sort of thing and how when I started to change my perceptions of things, change my judgments of things, change my inner energy, stuff like that, the horses were completely different. And so it, mm. it kind of gives me the permission to when someone's doing something and I can tell it's not, um, well, it's not working, but it's not, not that it's physically not working. It's the mental story they're telling themselves, which could have to do with childhood or anything, really. Sure. I can point it out without them feeling like they're being picked on. Right. Because I've shared that. That's an, I've shared at the start. I have found out for me, that's an important part of, that's a, probably the biggest part of the whole thing. And that's, that's why in the past, some people I couldn't help. Because right. they could get the technique right, but their internal dialogue and their, all, that sort of stuff, all that sort of stuff was incongruent, you know, with what they were actually doing on the outside. Right. And so, I, I, you know, it's almost like these days I get to point that out and no one gets offended. Right. Right. Yeah. You're speaking, they're, you're speaking the same language. Like they're, they're thinking that that's going to come up in the conversation. Right. And yeah. I've already, you know, I've already shared a lot. Not, not just at the clinic, but on videos and stuff about right. how that has helped me. Well, and that helps me because one of the questions I had for you that I think you've just answered is 
on your membership site, it says it's not a method, it's a mindset. That's kind of what you're talking about when you were referring to somebody, somebody can get the techniques, but if the, what's going on inside is not aligned, um, it's not going to work as well. Yeah. And well, any technique only works as well as your mental state about the technique. You can, you can, you can turn any technique into dominance if you look at it a certain way. Yes. You know, it's not what you're doing, it's why you're doing it or why you think you're doing it. Right. Which will make a difference in, in how you do it and how they perceive it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's really great. I think, and it's really cool too, because it's, it's, it applies to every, everyone, everyone with horses. It doesn't matter what your discipline, people, you know, listening to this will be going, okay, the, you know, what is going on in me and how can I improve that? And then most likely it'll improve no matter what you're doing, it'll improve that, that thing. Yeah. And, and what I found is there's a, there's a knock on effect because I have people go, you know what, since I started doing this stuff, I get along so much better with my husband, and my wife, and my kids, and my coworker, and my boss, or whatever. And the funny thing is, whatever it is that changes about them, they've they've been aware of it for many, many years. And so is their husband and their wife and their kids and their boss and their coworkers. Right. But they wouldn't do the work for their husband and their wife or their boss or their kids or their coworkers, but they'll do the work for their horses. And I think that's oh. one of the really cool thing about horses is people are passionate about them and want to get along with them and they will do what for the most part do whatever they have to do mm -hmm. to get that to work but but a lot of the stuff i'm about these days it's not horse stuff mm -hmm. and so it doesn't just when you change that it doesn't just change how you interact with the horses it right. basically changes how you interact with the rest of the world really yeah yeah that's fascinating. Um, so can you think of like, one of the things that I often bring up in this podcast is the idea that, you know, learning, learning can be one of the best things ever can be super inspiring and exhilarating, but it can also just, you know, knock your feet out from under you. It can be super challenging. Um, and can you think of a time in your journey where you were really struggling to learn something and then you got it and what you did to get through that struggle? Um, I can say probably back about 22 years ago, I think, I was training riding horses and, and I got to a point where I could get them to do things to a certain level. And they could do pretty physical things, but they they didn't do them with the style and the ease with which the, the really good guys could get their horses to do it with. And I was always trying to do more to get more. And I went to some different clinics with some, some of the best guys in the world and just turned me on my head as far as I did less and got the result I've been looking for. And, I, you know, I, a few years ago we had a, a – an intern came and stay with us who was really interested in salsa dancing when she was younger. And so she was so interested in salsa dancing that she actually went to, to when she went to school, went to university, she went to University of Mexico City so she could immerse herself in the salsa dancing scene. Wow. And she told me a, a dance saying that also applies to horses, but she said beginning dancers take intermediate lessons and intermediate lesson, intermediate dancers take advanced lessons, but advanced dancers take beginning lessons. Oh, that's so good. And what I and I think that's how the levels of anything go. When you're a beginner, you're trying to get to the advanced, the intermediate stage. When you're in the right. intermediate stage, you want to get to the advanced stage. And I there's a mindset shift somewhere between the intermediate and advanced stage where you have to realize I have to do less, I have to be more precise about the little things and let the big things take care of themselves rather than. Right focusing on the big thing so it's it's almost like um you know one of the the most spiritual the ancient hindu practices is something called karma yoga mm -hmm. and karma yoga is focusing on a task with no thought as to the outcome of that task mm -hmm. and what you've got to do is you've got to go back to the beginning and start all over again 
and just focus on that the stuff that you're doing because that's what you're doing not because it's going to get me to something else oh that's so interesting you know what i mean it's, it's about being present, present. So, I, so a number of years ago i did a tv show called the principles of training and each like each uh episode was a different principle and one of the principles of training is work with the horse you have today and it's actually work with the horse you have right now it doesn't mm-hmm. matter who he was five minutes ago you're going to deal with that horse in front of you right here right. and that's kind of the same thing you know instead of thinking well, i'm working with this horse but in a, in a month i've got to go to a show or you know, whatever right it's, it's what's going on you're, you're working with what's going on right now right that's really that's really interesting so I'm going to ask you something and I don't know if there's an answer to this, but, um, so in my journey, I, for many, many years, I was really focused on the outcome. I was focused on achieving and, and it, it kept me, I was driven, um, you know, it kept me progressing. And lately it's so interesting that you'd share that about, and you call it karma, karmic yoga, karma yoga. I don't karma call it karma yoga. yoga. Okay. <laughs> the Hindus okay. call it karma yoga, but it's, okay. it's, yeah, it's, it's the ancient Hindu practice of focusing on a ta- task with no thought as to the outcome. Of okay. That task. It's just being present really. Yeah. So lately I've been really drawn to just being with my horses. I have four of them out in a herd and that's all I want to do. And I really kind of struggle with that. Like, well, you're not achieving anything, but that's what I'm drawn to be doing. So if, if you're in that place where, you know, you're, you're looking at the horse that's in front of you, you're, you're not thinking about the outcome. How, how does that line up with goals or does it, does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. If you've ever watched any sporting event in America on TV, let's say it's early in the season and the Seattle Mariners are playing because you live up there Mm -hmm. uh, and they've won their first four games in a row and they're interviewing the pitcher and they say, so four games in a row, what do you think your chances are for the pennant this year? You know, go, oh, we're not really thinking about that. We're just going to stick to the basics and take it one game at a time. Right. That's how you win the pennant. Okay. That's how you win the World Series. Right. Stick to the basics and take it one game at a time. It's 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 everywhere. It's not just horses and not just right. baseball. It's not just football. But every every interview you'll see, they will say, you know, like when the reporter goes, "Well, you're doing really good this year. What do you think about?" And usually they'll go, hey, "We're not really focused on that. We're just focused on sticking to the plan." And that's really that's interesting. But then I think that there's an element somewhere of of looking at that pennant of you know that kid that was playing baseball in elementary school and envisioned that he was going to be a Mariner or, you know, that, that there's there, it seems like they need to play together somehow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, they do. But uh, uh, you know, when they interview that guy, this is, is not his first time in the Right. In the NBL. Right. and no, what is it? I don't know. I can't help you there. <laughs> You're on no, your own. This, is, this is not his first trip to town. Right. Like a young rookie. Right. He would probably be like, yeah, we're going to kick some ass, you know. Right. This is the old season guy who knows how to win the World Series. And this also lines up with what you shared earlier or just did in my brain. I don't know if it will for you, but what you shared about that you're not going to lock on to the people that think you're the best thing ever. And you're not going to lock onto the people that think you're terrible. Like those guys that have been there, they're not locking onto that immature view of I'm the best thing that's ever set foot on this field. They, they're, they know they've got to stay in the middle and, um, and be present and in, you know, enjoy the moment. Those yeah. And things. that being present thing, you know, you said a minute ago, like, all I want to do is sit around with my horse. Being present doesn't necessarily mean doing nothing. Absolutely. It, you mean it could be you could be training your horse, like I said when I first, you know, it was twenty two years ago or something rather, and I could do stuff for the running horse and I wanted to get better. And I learned to go back and do less. In order to do less, you've got to be present. You know, you've got to be working on that thing there, not that thing because it's going to get me to that thing. Because the basics are so hard because the little tiny parts of the basics you you can get the basics wrong and it still looks right but when you start to build on top of that you'll only get so far before those things that you missed 
become a parent, you've got to go back. You know, I, yeah. I said before, I used to go to New Zealand once a year. There's a horse expo there that I, until COVID, I'd, pre I'd presented it every year for six years. And most horse expos, you don't get to meet any of the other presenters because you're busy all day long and then you go home. Whereas this place has a, has a night show and they have a VIP section at the end of the arena for the night show. And so all the presenters get to, you know, you get to sit there and eat free food and drink free beer and watch the night show. They have a Grand Prix mm -hmm. show jumping. They have all sorts of fun stuff. And one of the guys I got to sat, sit with two years in a row, actually, is a, a guy from Holland named um, Rob Ahrens. And Rob Ahrens at the time was the Dutch Olympic show jumping coach. He had competed in two or three Olympics and he coached three Olympics. And by all reports, he's the most prolific um, Olympic show jumping coach of the modern era, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. And he got to talk about doing clinics. He does a lot of clinics. And I said, do you ever, do you ever have people come to a clinic and they go, my horse can only jump three foot. As soon as you put it up to three foot three, he can't jump anymore. We have all sorts of problems. Do you ever get to help those people at three feet or do you have to go back to the beginning? He goes, oh, Ooh. always have to go back to the beginning. If you, if you always can jump three foot and can't jump three foot three, it's not the horse. It's not a, a horse problem. It's not a jumping problem. Mm -hmm. There's a foundational problem somewhere. Right. And you've got to go back to the beginning. Another guy I met at the same horse expo, but different year. His name is Albert Vaughan. He's, a, he's from Holland as well. Mm -hmm. He's a show jumper. Won the silver medal at the 2000 Olympics. Hmm. In sh bronze medal. Silver medal in show jump. Coolest, coolest dude you've ever met. Very mm -hmm. old school military. Everything is just perfect. Um, and, I, you know, I usually have two or three uh, sessions a day at that horse expo, so I'm pretty busy, but... Right after one of my sessions in one of the arenas, Albert Vaughan was doing a, a thing on jumping a metre 50. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know anything about jumping, but a metre 50 is a big jump. Yeah. Okay. That's when yeah. it's getting serious. Right. So that would be like four and a half feet or under five? Uh, I forget, but it's it's, it's, the, it's, it's the start of serious jumping. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so I wanted to watch. So I, I, my session was going to finish, and 45 minutes later, I had to start another session in another arena. Mm -hmm. And Albert's thing's going to go for an hour and a half. And so I sit there. I want to watch how does that Olympic silver medalist work on something very, very big, mm -hmm. the hard stuff. So there's two riders come in there, and they're riding around, and he hasn't, there's, there's not even a ground rail on the ground. He hasn't riding around, he hasn't riding around one handed. Hmm. Going in walk, trot, can, and left circles one handed or left handed. Mm -hmm. Walk, trot, can, and right circles one, left handed. Walk, trot, can, and left circles right handed. Walk, trot, can, and right circles right handed. Mm -hmm. He seems to be doing nothing. And in 40, I had to leave after 45 minutes, but after 45 minutes, they haven't even gone over a single rail on the ground. And this is how to do the hard stuff in jumping. Right. And one of the things he said was, if you need two hands to control your horse right now, you're going to run out of control when you come to a minute 50. Oh, that's so interesting. So were, it, were most of the people able to do it or was that why it was taking so long? He was no, no, they, through. these are people who can jump that. Yeah, but were they able to do the what? Oh, yeah, they were able to do it. But he okay. was pointing out that if you can't do this, this this is not nothing. This looks right. like it's inconsequential. Right. This is the foundation of everything. If you if your so horse is it needs to be needs to have tight reins and two hands to be controlled at this point in time, you when you get to a meter fifty, you're not going to have a jumping problem. You can have a control problem. So interesting, and like you said, if the jump is lower, people can get away with that yeah. not being there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like Rob Aaron said, you know, that if they can jump three foot and they can't jump three foot three, it's not a jumping problem. There's a foundational problem. You know, I did a clinic in Scotland a number of years ago, and the guy that organised the clinic, he had been a black belt in karate when he was younger. And when he got to be a black belt and he, was, he wanted to be a second damn black belt, he thought he was going to learn all this new, cool stuff. And they said, you're not going to learn anything different. What you do now is now to be a second damn black belt, you go back to the beginning and you start all over again with a black belt's eyes. You see everything completely differently. And then you're going to relearn everything you've ever learned with a deeper understanding of it. 
so it's so you're interesting not, you're not doing more you do you, you go back and it's just like i said you know about beginners do the advanced lessons and uh, uh, intermediate lessons and intermediate people tend to take advanced lessons right but once you get to the advanced level you got to go back and go okay I can now see things in such a way that I can go back and relearn everything from the beginning right. with a deeper understanding. And you've probably seen that meme flutter on Facebook. You know, it's not a straight line, it's a spiral, and you go mm-hmm. back and see deeper truths in things you thought right. you understood. Right. Yeah, it's that. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I mean, it completely applies to horsemanship. Each time you take oh. on a different horse, you're a different person. You might be starting at the beginning, um, but that's really, really cool. It's a great illustration of that. You know, the thing I try to teach at clinics, I'm, 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 obviously I'm helping people with their horses and, mm-hmm. and I'm showing them certain techniques to do with their horses. But the things I tend to do, which is why my clinics are probably different than other people's, is I spend a lot of time drawing the parallels between horses and the things in life that we already know. I decided to turn this into a two-part interview to give you a chance to soak on all the things you just heard and not try to pack it all into one sitting. Warwick mentioned many people and videos in this first part, and there are links to all of those references in the show notes. In part two, we'll dive into how Warwick draws parallels between horsemanship and life in his clinics, how knowing the why behind what we do is so important, and also getting to know the four channels of awareness and how it can change everything. We hope you join us for part two.